and welcome everyone to this how-to session where I'll be giving a practical demonstration of how to perform FTP and interest rate risk stress testing as we transition globally away from IBOR type reference rates to alternative reference rates, also known as risk-free rates. Let me take you through what I plan to cover for you in the session. I'm just moving on to my agenda here. So I'll start with a bit of background on the topic and I'll mention how ARR products look likely to develop versus LIBOR. I'll go through some software enhancements we're doing at Moody's to support this in our tool dedicated to ALM and FTP. And then I'll show you a practical demo looking at the curves that are needed and an interest rate risk and FTP worked example. Finally, I'll mention some useful points about compounding and accrual methodologies, and I'll leave time for questions at the end. So let's start by reviewing the current status. Uh, here I have what I've uh, called my map of preparedness. It's very much the case that ju different jurisdictions are running at different speeds on this transition. And the question to ask yourselves is, is what currencies do you have on your balance sheet? Here I've selected a few examples of alternative reference rates in jurisdictions that are furthest along on the transition. There's some other jurisdictions are, for example, Russia, South Africa, where there's ongoing consultations on what to designate as their alternative reference rate. But my worked examples later on focus on one of the most prepared, the US, where SOFA has been selected as the preferred alternative reference rate. When it comes to the characteristics of ARR-linked products, primarily loan products, we still have a number of unknowns because this area is still evolving. But patterns are emerging, so let's go through what we do know. So the primary reason the switch to alternative reference rates is in progress is because these reference rates are based on tangible transactions rather than the quote system that got LIBOR such a bad reputation. These trades are in the overnight markets and can be secured or unsecured. For example, SOFA is the rate for overnight loans secured by US Treasuries. The link to central bank rates means ARRs track policy rates closely. So whereas LIBOR embeds a credit premium related to the bank as a counterparty, as a rule, ARRs don't. The behavior of the two rates can therefore be different in stress and in fact were in the, in the stress experience last year. At the current time, we assume that products will be linked to pure ARR. There are some efforts for benchmarks to be developed which combine uh, risk-free rate concepts with a credit element. Another important feature is that coupons for products linked to ARRs are derived from averages of daily rates over an historical period. That's very unlike LIBOR, which is forward-looking. And finally, existing overnight rates, such as OIS rates, operate under a postfix convention. So unlike LIBOR, the customer won't know their interest payment ahead of time. That's unless variations to the base case convention are adopted, which is what I will cover in my worked examples. Let me give an illustration of term rates versus overnights that use backward-looking compounding. So forward-looking term rates like LIBOR factor in expectations regarding interest rate movements and are already available at the start of the interest period. Attempts are underway to develop term alternative reference rates as well uh, to measure a forward expectation of overnight IRRs over a designated term. But at the current time, liquidity is still building in OIS swaps, and so methods often rely on, on for example, basis swaps with LIBOR. Though we need these types of curves for forecasting and discounting, Regulators are discouraging linking actual products directly to these until there's better liquidity or an accepted market methodology for term alternative reference rates. So we assume that for the foreseeable future, ARR products will derive their coupon payments from simple or compounded averaging of backward-looking alternative reference rates, which I'm showing here. This is an extract from a Bank of England paper which illustrates Sonia overnight rates and how to derive coupons for a Sonia product. A set of overnight rates needs to be compounded up so that every coupon payment doesn't have to be made, so that a coupon payment doesn't have to be made every single day. 
And the issue for coupon payments like this is that because an overnight rate can change every day, the customer won't know until the last day of the period what compounded rate they're actually paying. So what's happened is various averaging conventions like lags and lockouts are being used to make this more amenable for the customer. So I'll go through those now. These are some examples of averaging conventions which have started to become more popular for use in banking products. In, in the plain or base case overnight compounding convention, daily rates over the last, say, one month are compounded into a single payment paid on the last day of that month. So uh, my key here is showing that the dotted lines show the coupon period, uh, the dark gray box shows the period the daily rates are selected, and the light gray box, the period daily rates are weighted, which depends on the, the business day um, convention. Um, the triangle is when the interest payment is known, and the, the square is when the interest payment's actually made. So as you can see in the base case, the interest payment's only known on the day it's paid. So where clients would prefer notice of the interest amount, that's where variations to the base case are being suggested. For example, payment delay um, is very similar to the base case, but the actual interest payment is made a couple of days after the end of the interest period. Uh, with an observation period shift, the uh, rates that are compounded actually shift back into being selected from the previous coupon period. And look back is very similar to observation period shift. It's also a, a lagged type convention. Uh, the, the difference is the way that um, business days are treated. Lockout is uh, similar going back to the, to the plain or base case. Um, but towards the end of the period, the last few days, the rate's actually frozen so that um, the customer knows ahead of time what the full co coupon payment will be. I'll cover off um, these two examples, the plain and plain sofa loan and a lag sofa loan with an observation period shift uh, in this session. So in response to this benchmark transition in the markets, Moody's has been making enhancements to our software, um, our software that caters to ALM and FTP, um, known as Risk Confidence. So this information here is available on our public website. Um, the, the path to the website's at the top right-hand corner there. Um, to summarize, some conventions um, were already available in risk confidence for some products, but we've now extended the range of conventions, as you can see here, and the coverage of the conventions has also been extended to more products, products that would not traditionally have been linked to OIS type rates until now. Uh, please do make note of the notes at the bottom, which indicate which functionality is included in which version release. As a sweeping statement, for interest rate risk, all the functionality was released in March, and for FTP, there'll be some additional functionality released in October. In terms of curve functionality, this functionality was essentially all, already there. Major items relevant for the new benchmarks include being able to forecast overnight indices, input term yield curves, as well as input historical interest rates. And I'll show some examples of actual curves in our software now before moving on to the worked examples. So we effectively need to think about two types of curve for the new benchmarks. And here you can see that I've set up um, a, a group of curves called alternative under an alternative reference rate um, set. Uh, starting with the input of a term curve, I've used US dollar SOFA as an example. And as you can see, this is a yield curve. The value date is the same as the reporting date I'm using, which is up here. Um, and the tenors are different, as we can see here. This curve is needed in order to discount cash flows for interest rate risk in the banking book purposes. And it can also be used to generate an overnight index, which I'll cover in a minute. Term curves are also needed to calculate, calculate forward-looking components of an FTP rate, primarily the liquidity premium. And here I'm assuming the liquidity premium is the difference between term SOFA, 
and an all-in cost of funds that I've built here, which you can see is also a yield curve. I'll come back to this in the worked examples. So the term rates entered in yield curves are prefix rates like LIBOR. So they're not the rates we're going to compound into coupons. For this, we need an actual index of overnight rates, which I've built here uh, and called it daily rates. As you can see, that's a standalone index instead of a yield curve. And here you can see different value dates and only one tenor, which is overnight. It's worth noting rates equivalent to this index can in fact be generated from the term SOFA curve I, I've uh, just shown you is still depicted here above. So instead of building the index separately, the RCA software can auto generate daily implied forward rates, which align with the term curve. So I'm going to um, show you some examples of how we could set up two products linked to this overnight index. Here in my chart of accounts, I've got two loans. Uh, one I've set up as a plain um, SOFA loan with 30-day uh, coupons. And the other I've set up with a five-day observation period shift. Um, they're both 90-day loans. And so as they're paying 30-day coupons, they'll, they'll pay three coupons. Um, let's look at the details of the plain SOFA loan. Here we go. As you can see, the, the value date for this loan is the same as my reporting date. So it's starting today and maturity is 90 days later. And it's floating on that uh, index. Um, the discount curve is my term yield curve. It's the fixing rule section down here, which actually denotes that coupons should be averaged. And uh, he here I need to select overnight index swap and then choose my fixing compounding convention. Can either be compound interest or simple interest. So on this loan, every 30 days, the individual overnight rates from the index I showed you will be compounded up to a single coupon payment. Um, and for interest rate risk, those will be our floating interest payments. And now let's look at the lagged loan, which I've got here. All of the characteristics are the same. But you can see in the fixing section, I've designated a five-day observation period shift by entering a minus five in the field at next coupon date. You can see that I could alternatively designate a look back convention or lockout days convention. Or to designate a payment delay convention, that's instead entered up here under the payment day rule. So if I were to select number of days in respect to the calculation date and I wanted a payment delay of two days, I'd enter it too. So now I'm going to move on to my worked example. Um, let's start with interest rate risk. So for my interest rate risk worked example, I want to show you the impact that these conventions like observation period shift will have on interest rate sensitivity. And I'm going to use those two loans. And I've set up two scenarios. The first is a base scenario, which has the following building blocks, including in my market data section, that um, group of alternative reference rate curves and the standalone index that I showed you. I've then got an interest rate shift scenario with the same curves, but where I'm overlaying a 2% upward shift to all of them as a transformation. So let's do a run where I'll run those two scenarios together. And this is how I do my run here. I've actually already done this um, as a single deal run on the plain um, SOFA loan. 
Um, so under my cash flow section, I'm showing here uh, my valuation cash flows. V stands for valuation. And uh, this is the first scenario. And below this line is the second scenario, the shock scenario. So as you can see, as promised, there's three interest payments. I stands for interest and then one notional payment uh, at 90 days at maturity. Um, and you can see in the, um, in the shock scenario, um, those rates have gone up exactly 2%. Um, and you can also see that the discount factors um, have dropped in the shock, which is what we would expect. Um, I've actually exported these results so we can see them more clearly. So let me go back to my slides. So uh, as I said, we have the three coupon rates for the plain sofa loan in the base scenario. which you can see have gone up in the shock scenario. And the first coupon rate here is 2.42%. So let me show you how that's actually been derived. If you recognize that standalone index of daily rates, here each of the 30 daily rates from the 30th of April to the 30th of May have been compounded up to that rate of 2.42% paid on the 30th of May. And all 30 rates underlying the compounding and discounting move up um, that entire 2% shock. So what happens instead with my lagged SOFA loan, which has the five-day observation period shift? Well, to account for the five-day shift, the index of forecast one-day rates is supplemented by actual past market rates from pre the reporting date. For every coupon for this lag loan, then, there are a slightly different set of 30 rates being compounded up. And importantly, from a sensitivity point of view, for the lag loan, for the first coupon, only 25 overnight rates underlying the compounding move up that 2% shock. The first five rates included in the compounding are actuals booked before the reporting date. And what this means is both Delta NII and Delta EV will be impacted by including a lag convention. If I'd chosen a 10-day rather than a five-day shift, the sensitivity would have been impacted more. And let me actually show you these results. Uh, for completeness, the exported results from the lag loan as well as the, as the uh, plane loan, um, we've got as I said, slightly different coupon rates for the lag loan. And that first coupon rate in shock, whereas for the, for the plain loan, it was moving up a full 2%. For the lagged loan, it's not moving up that full 2%. And on the next slide, I'll show you the sensitivity results to show there's a slightly different impact from the shock even though, as you can see here, the discount factors being applied to the two loans are the same because they're both using that term SOFA curve for discounting. And here are our sensitivity results. The plain SOFA loans Delta EV remain static because both coupons and discount factors increase by that full 2%. However, with the lag loan, the Delta EV drops because the discount factors have increased by 2%, but the first coupon didn't. In a similar way, the NII will not move up as much as the shock, um, as the shock won't fully apply to the first coupon. Let's just um, have a quick look at that in the system. So under deal results, um, this is where you can see that there wasn't much of a move in the market value for that plain sofa loan. Now I've talked about um, I've talked about valuation cash flows um, up until now, um, but I also want to mention rate cash flows, which is what we use to build repricing gaps. So if I move to view the repricing gaps, which are housed here. 
you can see the plain alternative reference rate loan is showing up in the first bucket because, of course, it's an overnight repricing loan. In terms of the impact compounding conventions could have on repricing gaps, there's kind of two options. You could either recognize them as overnight resetting as well, or as having an element of mismatch due to a lag or a lockout. The, method, the methodology we've gone with is the latter, sorry, is the former, is uh, recognizing them as overnight resetting um, so that they appear in repricing gaps in line with the reset rate itself, um, which ensures less complexity when analyzing repricing gaps. And it also aligns with the approach recommended by some regulators, such as the HKMA in Hong Kong. To conclude for our interest rate risk in the banking book worked example then, uh, the compounding convention will impact sensitivity, but as I've stated, they won't impact the position for an alternative reference rate product in a repricing gap, as that will always be overnight. Um, I'll just... Uh, show you the exports in my slides. So as you can see, for both sets of loans, uh, they're both sitting in that overnight repricing gap, no matter whether they've got the lag or not. So now let's um, move on, on to a worked example for FTP, and I'm going to use the same two loans. So funds transfer pricing rates consist of components. And for my FTP worked example, I want to show you the impact that these ARR conventions will have on those components. My worked example includes three components, one to calculate the floating rate element of the FTP rate, and two, to calculate a liquidity premium. The floating interest rate element will be using the compounded one-day rates from the daily rates index. So for the floating rate component, similar to what I showed in the previous worked example, the lag loan will have a slightly different rate for every coupon versus the plain SOFA loan because of compounding a slightly different set of rates. Now let's look at the liquidity premium. For my plain SOFA loan, to calculate my liquidity premium, I'm generating two components, uh, one um, taken from uh, my cost of funds curve and the other taken from my SOFA term curve, and I'm taking the difference between the two. I've set my two components to take the rates at the maturity of the loan, and if you remember, the loan was 90 days, so I'll pick up a 90-day rate on the two term curves, and the liquidity premium will be the spread between them. It's worth noting here that the curves I'm using are the curves for the value date, which is the start date of the plain SOFA loan. But what happens if I want to calculate the liquidity premium for a loan with an observation period shift instead? Well, what you might want to do is instead of taking curves at the start date of the loan, you instead use the term curve, which aligns with the period the loan is lagged for. And if you do that, the product convention will, of course, impact the LP component you calculate. And this is an item we have in our roadmap um, for our next release in October. Let me show you how I would um, set these up in the software. So I'm going to go to my FTP sets now. And I'm going to um, use these FTP sets, which have my components. And I'll apply those to my loans on the balance sheet. So for my plain SOFA loan, I've got an interest rate component, which is compounding from the overnight index. And I've got two other components, which, like I said, are picking up 
uh, a rate from the SOFA term curve at maturity and the cost of funds curve at maturity. I'll take the difference to give me my liquidity premium. Now, an alternative way to set things up if I did want those conventions to impact my LP cal calculation would be to use an FTP set as follows instead. I've got the same method with my floating component, but the components to calculate my uh, liquidity premium are using are referring up to a formula where the value date of my reference curves could vary according to the loans compounding convention. This is a more complex way to set things up, but we're making it available to you with our next software release in October. For the purposes of my worked example, I'll run the more simple set of FTP components against my plain SOFA loan, which I can do here using my base scenario. Um, and again, I've already done that for my plain SOFA loan, and here are the results. If you remember, the first coupon on the plain SOFA loan was 2.4%. And picking a rate at maturity on the cost of funds versus the term SOFA yield curve, that's going to give me a spread of 1%. And I've, again, exported that here uh, onto my slides. The interest rate risk component being calculated using that overnight index, although please note I'm going to mention something relevant to this regarding accruals in a later slide, and the LP, the spread between those two term curves. And of course, if for a lag loan, you choose to pick rates from curves from five days previously, uh, a lag loan would actually end up with a different liquidity premium. So that's the end of my worked examples. But to finish up here, I want to um, highlight some technical details about a compounding and accrual methodologies. So uh, when it comes to compounding methodologies, this is relevant if you're using an older version of RCO where um, uh, the, the previous RCO compounding formula was slightly different um, to what we have now. We've aligned uh, the compounding convention with the ISDA, sorry, the compounding formula with the ISDA definition um, because that's what markets have moved towards. Um, however, it really uh, very small differences um, is the, it's the treatment of calendar versus business days. Um, if you would like more details, then please just drop us a line. And a second technical detail to go through is regarding FTP accruals. So if daily accruals are being posted to your ledger, we'll be making an enhancement to, sh to ensure that only known actual rates are used in the accrual calculation. So for example, despite the full 30-day um, compounded rate being calculated for cash flow purposes for projected FTP, as 2.42%, the FTP accrual will exclude any forecast rates and only be based on actuals. So in this example, it would be based on the single rate of the 30th of April, uh, which is quite small here, but you can see it's 2.76%, uh, and that's the formula that would give you your accrual. So let me just summarize everything that I have just been through. For performing interest rate risk stress testing and FTP using alternative reference rates, the curves that are required are an overnight, uh, overnight indices, uh, which are used to compound coupons for the products, and term yield curves to discount, uh, to do discounting um, and possibly to calculate um, liquidity premiums. 
And then in terms of the impact that conventions have on your analytics, um, interest rate risk in the banking book sensitivity will be impacted. So that's both uh, EV or market value and um, NII or earnings at risk. Um, also, uh, if, if we're talking about repricing gaps, we need to keep in mind that um, the conventions won't um, impact where the positioning is in the repricing gap, as it will always um, show an alternative reference rate overnight loan in the overnight bucket. For FTP, the IR component will, of course, be impacted by lags and lockouts. Um, and the FTP liquidity premium um, can be impacted, uh, as I showed you, um, depending on the methodology you choose.